I realize that this is the Christmas season and it would have been fairly appropriate to um, have a message that is more closely related to the first coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But as I'm hoping we will see, uh, I trust that we can truly rejoice together in who the Lord Jesus Christ has made us to be, and that is the beloved of our God. I bring you greetings from uh, Kabwata Baptist Church. It's already been said, it's the church that I am pastoring uh, back home, and uh, your, your pastors preached there before many years ago, and when I announced that we had arrived, we already began having feedback from back home, uh, remembering that precious visit. Well, do turn with me to First John and chapter 3. First John and chapter 3. We will begin reading from chapter 2, verse 28, up to chapter 3 and verse 3. 1 John chapter 2, begin to read from verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Well, brethren, the, the greatest force in this world is, is not nuclear energy. It is love. It is by far the greatest force. And if you were to ask yourself the question, why is it that the Christian faith is such an energized faith? Herein lies the answer itself. It is the fact that it is based on love. And that's one reason why the passage that I have just read out to you is so significant. John, who wrote this epistle, was writing in order to encourage believers to know that they have eternal life, as he puts it in chapter 5 and verse 13. He says, "There I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And as he was writing, he gives a number of tests in this epistle that would enable you to, to check yourself. Am I a Christian or am I not? And yet as he does so, he's not one who is simply listing those tests. Rather, he is interacting with them in his own experience and is also urging those that he is writing to to interact with those tests, even as he writes. 
as he enters into chapter 3, he, he pauses for a moment and, and simply expresses his own amazement at the love that God has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And really, in doing so, he is inviting us to, as it were, pause with him to, to celebrate that which God has done for us. And really, in, as we look at this passage, that's where I want us to, to pause for a moment. To ask ourselves the question, do we do this? In the midst of the difficulties and challenges of life, in the midst of the, the, the busyness that we are often involved in, do we take time away from all these, the trials, the difficulties, the busyness, to simply, as it were, drink in this reality, the reality that we are loved? That we are loved with an everlasting love. That we are loved infinitely by this great and glorious God. I want to suggest to you that if we don't do that, we are missing out on a lot. We are missing life with a capital L. Yes, we may speak in terms of I am saved. We may speak in terms of I am going to heaven. But we, we are not refreshed in the present in the midst of all those realities. Allow me to also add that if we are not posing in this way, we, we, we are also depriving ourselves of the energy that causes us to be shining lights in this world. Because ultimately, when we speak in terms of witnessing or, or evangelizing or, or discipling others, we do it out of the overflow of our hearts. Now, if the heart is not overflowing, then clearly that kind of labor is no longer a labor of love, a labor of joy. Instead, it is something you will want to shun away from. So what I want us to do briefly this um, uh, morning is, 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 is park in this passage of scripture for a moment. So just park there and allow ourselves to drink something of the glorious truths that are in this passage. John says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Clearly, Assurance of eternal salvation includes an overwhelming realization that God has made us special objects of his love. And this is what John captures here. I hope you are not missing the excitement that is in his voice as he thinks about this, as he bends it down, as he makes this invitation to us to, to, to look again at what God has done for us. In the old King James Version, it speaks in terms of behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished on us. He's not simply saying, behold the love, but behold the, the kind of love. It's a statement that's, that's supposed to, to cause us to express astonishment altogether. Look at the kind of love uh, that 
God has bestowed upon us. That invitation, is it something that is, is currently part of your life? This astonishment, this exhilarating thought that God should love you in a peculiar way? Uh, the phrase, what kind of, is used in a number of passages in Scripture. And I just want us to quickly look at two of them. One of them is uh, Matthew 8 and verse 27. Matthew 8 and verse 27. Let's just quickly turn there. It's an amazement concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am hoping that as we capture the, the emotion of the moment, we should come back and ask ourselves, is that the kind of emotion that is in our own souls as we think of God's love for us? Matthew 8 and verse 27. Uh, the Bible reads there, And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and the sea obey him? Let me quickly give you the story. The, the uh, disciples were on a boat, and in the midst of that boat, they underwent a major storm. They were fearing for their lives. As far as they were concerned, they were as good as dead. Jesus, thankfully, was in the boat. And so they, they woke him up. And in waking him up, they were saying, don't you care that we're perishing here? The Lord Jesus Christ woke up and simply rebuked the storm. And it was still. Now, if you were in that boat, I know what would be happening to you. You'd be looking at this man in the boat with a sense of emotion gripping you, wondering, now, who on earth is this? This is what is in this question. What manner of man? What sort of man? What kind of man is this? I want to ask, is, is, is that how you are overwhelmed with the thought of the love of God for you? What kind of love is this? That God should make me his child. What kind of love is this? Well, we find the same when uh, Mary was being given the greeting by an angel in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 29. Luke 1 and verse 29. I begin reading from verse 28. And he, that is angel Gabriel, came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And we are told, but she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern, there it is, what sort of greeting this might be. Again, you can capture something of the astonishment in that moment. When here was an angel, perhaps in, 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 in clothing that was extremely bright, standing before her with a light she had not seen before, and all she is getting is this greeting. And the greeting is calling her, O oh, favored one, telling her, the Lord is with you. And clearly, in that moment, she's recognizing that she is undergoing an experience like she's never had before. She is, in that moment, wondering what 
on earth is this all about? What kind of greeting is this? There must be something more. Something much, much more. And consequently, she steadies her own heart for what is coming next. I'm asking, is that you with respect to the love of God? In the midst of all the challenges of life, are you astonished? Are you exhilarated? Are you amazed at the love with which God has loved you? Charles Wesley writes, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love? Died he for me who caused his pain, me who him to death pursued, and he says it's amazing love. Totally amazing. That's the way he responds to it. That my God should die for me, should have any interest in me. Again, let me ask. Is, is, is that you? Are, you? are you mesmerized by this love? Do you often sit alone and fail to comprehend the magnitude of God's love. John refers to this as a love that has been given to us. In other words, it's not a love that we have earned. It's not a love that has come to us because of something unique or special in us. But it is a love that has been freely granted to us. Well, how is this love expressed? This love is expressed in making us children of God children of the Lord himself see what kind or manner of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God or let me read it as it is in terms of its literal translation See what kind of love the Father has given us, that children of God we should be called. That children of God we should be called. In other words, the emphasis is this translation from being the enemies of God, living in sin and degradation, to becoming God's children. Now normally when this phrase is used, it is in terms of adoption. In other words, it's the, the legal position that God has moved us into. And I admit it is overwhelming enough for us to think of it that way. That, that God should adopt us into his family. But brethren, what John is talking about here is something at a further level. And he's talking about God's regenerating work. The work of regeneration. And that's the reason why I want us to begin with uh, verse 29. Verse 29. Um, chapter 2 verse 29 and we'll see it on the on the screen there if you know that he is righteous you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him in other words what springs forth this thought of John is not so much adoption as 
the regenerating work of God that transforms us from the inside out. Remember, he's dealing with this whole subject of assurance of salvation. And what he is saying is simply this, that if you are living in sin, you cannot be assuring yourself to be a child of God. You can't. Because ultimately, we must begin with God. And God is righteous. He is holy. And if God is righteous and he is holy, and his fruit is taking place in us, and we ourselves are now righteous and holy, the mathematics is fairly easy to finish off. Then surely we are born of him. He is the one who is producing all this in us. That's the reason why we are what we are. We are born of a righteous and holy God. Consequently, he is producing this righteousness and this holiness. And then he pauses and says, what a wonder. What kind of love is this? That we, children of God, may be called. Because we've experienced this change, this transformation on the inside. And friends, this is what this love has done. It is a love that has, as it were, reached out into the, the rubbish bin, into the sewer pipe, and pulled us out of there and cleaned us up and then put us next to God in his family. Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. Because to begin with, God at a click of a finger, could have simply produced a new humanity. He doesn't do that. Instead, he reaches out to his worst enemies. Those who are bent on breaking his laws. Those who pursue his son to his death by their own wickedness and sin. God reaches out by his spirit and changes us from the inside out, giving to us something of his nature. Now, later on in this passage, John answers a question that can only show that this is the right interpretation. And it is the question, if God has made this transformation in us, how come the world doesn't notice this? How come the world does not celebrate us? How come the world doesn't sit back and say, wow, look at them, wow, how come? And friends, when we start judging ourselves, by the standards of this world, you know what happens? We degrade what God has done for us and in us by, our, by his love. That's what we do. The truth is, the reason why the world does not pause and say exactly these words, see what kind of love God has bestowed upon these. Look at what he has done in them. The reason why the world doesn't do that is because it is blind. Spiritually blind. And John gives us the evidence here. 
Look at the way he puts it. In verse 1, halfway through. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. In other words, forget about us. Because at least in our case, we are not even perfect yet. Look at Jesus. The perfect son of God. He was on earth. Was he the attraction of the world? Was the world mesmerized by his presence? Did they make him ruler and king over their lives? No. They rushed him to the cross. Crucify him. Crucify him. They got rid of him. Now, if they could not see the sun in its noonday strength, do you honestly think they will see you? Of course not. So the argument of John here is an all-important one. And it is this, don't judge yourself by the opinion of this world, by the media and its way of picturing believers. Don't. Otherwise, if you do, you know what we are? We are bigoted. Narrow-minded, holier than thou, judgmental, small-hearted individuals. That's what we are. And consequently, you get rather ashamed of the Christian faith. It's the kind of thing you want to hide because you don't even know how you ended up getting involved in all this. John is saying, don't. The world is blind. Don't. Instead, judge yourself by God's revelation. And that's what he goes on to say in verse 2 when he says, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And that's his point at the end of our initial sentence. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Let me say it again. And so we are. This is not something futuristic. It's not God saying, this is what's going to happen to you later when you arrive in heaven. No. This change is what the love of God has already begun to work in our lives. We are now, now, now children of God. Transformed by him. By an almighty power that gives life to the dead. God has given us new birth. And friends, this is what explains the transformation that he talked about in chapter 2, verse 29, when he said, everyone who practices righteousness has been born of God. It's, it's a work that God has already begun to do. It's at an experiential level. In other words, if we are going to celebrate this statement, we need to be amazed about ourselves. We need to be amazed by the kind of attitudes that are in us. Our thoughts, 
our words, our actions. And we are able to say, you know what, this is not me. I know myself very well. It must be God. It must be God who has done this work in me. Consequently, I can say for certain, now I'm a child of God. Now! What I will be then, I don't know. The only thing I know is that when Jesus Christ appears, I will be like him. But I can testify for sure I am not what I once used to be. God has brought about this change in me. Now, there are two implications of that, and John deals with them in the rest of this chapter. In fact, all the way into chapter 4 and up to the beginning of chapter 5. So you can see that this verse that we are looking at is, is one that sort of brings to birth a number of all important thoughts. The first is one that it touches in verse 3, and it is the fact that, you see, when you, you begin to realize this reality, this, this overwhelming reality, it, it's what spurs you on in the path of godliness, in the path of righteousness. He says there in verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. In other words, you see, what makes Christianity such a moral force in the world is not that we try to live a righteous life so that God can accept us. Uh-uh. It's the other way around. It's that God has accepted us as we are and then transformed us, consequently we are able to live a righteous life. And so when you realize that, all that happens in you is you want to be more and more and more godly. That's all you want. And that's what John deals with here. In fact, he deals with it all the way from verse 4 down to verse 10. His argument is simple. We won't have time to read the whole of it. But his argument is simply this. That there is a moral transformation that takes place in the hearts of those of us who are God's true children. Because he has made us his children. And our lives show it. Where it is not showing it, we must not continue entertaining the idea that we are God's children because we are a contradiction. Verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Exactly what we saw in chapter 2 verse 29. Then the opposite, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And I end on this verse. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Remember where we started chapter 2 verse 29? That's why John is saying, see what God has done. Ours is not a mere religion. It's not simply going to church and trying to obey rules, do's and don'ts, 
laws, and so on. It is a transformed life by the love of God. And the transformed life produces fruit unto righteousness and holiness. And he says those that do this are God's children. There's another implication of this. And it is that of love. Loving one another. And that's what it takes up all the way from verse 11 to chapter 5. With a small break in chapter 4 from verse 1 to verse 6. He introduces it at the end of verse 10 when he says whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God and then he says no is the one who does not love his brother. And consequently he says for this is the message that we've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Again that's Christianity. Let me put it this way. Christianity is not one that forces you to love. It is one that produces love in your heart because of the love of God for you. Towards the end of all that John has to say here, let's quickly go to chapter 4 and verse 18. Chapter 4 and verse 18. It says there, we love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. In other words, again, it's a response. It's a response. It's, it's what God has done for us. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. He has changed us. He has transformed us by his regenerating power. And consequently, he has put in us the capacity to love that was previously impossible. And that's what we see him arguing throughout here. That's the Christian faith, brethren. That's the Christian faith. It is one that speaks about an infinite love that has transformed us. Let me ask again. Do you pause? Do you? Do you shut out the world with all its noise, its busyness, and then say, what kind of love is this? Do you? Especially when you think of what you once were outside Christ, wallowing in filth and sin, foolish, in darkness, self-destructive, and everything else. Especially once you look at your friends and the, and the kind of decisions that they have made, the, the enslavement that they, they have on their lives uh, to all kinds of evil and wickedness and sin. And then you say, that's me, but for the grace of God. I'm asking, do we pause and then say, what kind of love is this? What kind of love? Especially as we come to a Christmas season like this and recall that God sent his son. It was actually his own initiative. He sent his son. To a young virgin. We just read it a few minutes ago. Mary. And Angel Gabriel greets her. And she's completely amazed. He has set into motion this love. 
that finally results in the death of God's own son. Do we pause and say, what kind of love is this? What kind of love is this? Are we surprised and amazed at what God has done with our own lives? With our lives? The capacity in us to say no to sin. No. Which wasn't there before. The hunger for godliness and holiness. The capacity to love one another. Even when we brush ourselves or one another the wrong way. To say this is my brother, this is my sister. And to love. To meet the needs of one another. Instead of looking the other way. And we just find ourselves sacrificing. I'm asking, are, are, are we part of that amazement? John here is saying, join me in the amazement. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. He's, he's including himself there. See. And when he's saying see, he's not asking you to, to stand in, in the outer court and peep in and, and sort of get surprised. He's saying jump in and celebrate. Rejoice in this love. Let that joy overflow in your life to others. They might be blind. They might be thinking you're just crazy. A few nuts have gone loose in your brain. That's okay. Yours is a joy. Because you have beheld a love like no other. And it produces in you emotions that you cannot shut up. Dear friends, this is Christianity. This is the Christianity of the Bible. And let's not allow the world to redefine it. No, no, no. A thousand times no. Ours is a glorious faith. It's not mere religion that is of human effort. It is a response to an infinite, glorious, immense love of God. Oh, may each one of us learn, even during this Christmas season, to just pause and drink in that love until we are overwhelmed by it and want to share it with others. Let us pray.